New documents accessed by NDTV have released shocking details about the release of the Bilkis Banu rapists. A court document shows that the premature release of 11 men convicted for the gang rape of Bilkis Banu and killing of her family during the 2002 Gujarat riots was approved by the Home Ministry within just two weeks and that the CBI and the special court had actually opposed the clearance. The Gujarat government on Monday told the Supreme Court that the men were released as they had been in jail for 14 years and their behaviour was found to be good. Good. Also, the centre had conveyed its approval. The Supreme Court is hearing three petitions from CPM Politburo member Subhashni Ali, Trinamool Congress MP Mahua Moitra and another person challenging the release of the men. Srinivasan Jain has the details. The, the sort of shocking details that have now emerged from uh, the state government, the Gujarat government actually filing an affidavit which runs close to 500 pages to the Supreme Court justifying why they released these men has actually uncovered the paper trail of all those who are behind this uh, startling release. Starting off, of course, uh, the big news being that the centre, the Home Ministry itself, uh, signed off on the release of these men. We already knew that the Gujarat government had said that they have released these men on account of the fact that these men uh, were well behaved both in jail and during their parole. Uh, but now it emerges that the centre not just cleared the release of these 11 men, but also did that in just the span of about two weeks. According to these court documents accessed by NDTV, the Gujarat government writes to the centre on the 28th of June of this year, saying that will they get the go-ahead to release these men. The Home Ministry replies on the 10th of July, literally as I said in the span of about 14 days, saying that yes, they can go ahead and release these 11 men. What makes this all the more shocking is that this is despite objections, strong objections, both by the CBI, which actually investigated these men, uh, the case, and was uh, the prosecuting agency, as well as the special court in Mumbai, which actually convicted these men. Uh, the CBI told uh, the Gujarat government in, in response to its letter that uh, the offence by the Bilkis rapist was heinous, grave and serious, and that they cannot be released early. The special court said, that the Bilkis rape convicts committed the worst form of hate crime, that even pregnant women and minors were not spared, and that Bilkis and her family were attacked on grounds of religion, and therefore these convicts do not deserve early release. So you had objections by two, uh, not one, but by two different uh, entities, the CBI and the special court, uh, saying quite clearly that there are grave reasons not to release these 11 men, but despite that, as we saw, there was an attempt not just to release them, but almost fast-track the release of these convicts. This is another dimension to the story which is emerging from these uh, court documents, that even before they were actually fully and formally released uh, by the Gujarat government, uh, these men actually enjoyed thousands of days of freedom, even though they'd been convicted of a grave offence, ranging in the case uh, of most of these men from anywhere up to three and a half to almost four years if you total up all the days that they'd been released. As I said, amounting to thousands of days uh, for each of these men for both uh, what is called uh, parole as well as furlough. Now again, this seems highly unusual given the gravity of the crime uh, that these men, remember, just once again were convicted of gang raping Bilkis, of killing members of a family and including killing a minor. For them to be given such long periods of release seems highly unusual and does raise a question mark about whether the intent all along uh, was to release them in a full and final way. Again, Gargi, this is important because remember that uh, there have been multiple media reports uh, suggesting that uh, the witnesses in this case, as well as those who are associated with Bilkis's family, have filed multiple complaints to the police saying that these men would be uh, you know, out on days of parole, enjoying freedom and also threatening and harassing them. So there was a whole record of these men actually, according to these allegations, uh, not really meeting the standards of their parole. But despite that, uh, it seems that they were granted, as I had, you know, months if not years of parole, but also that so-called good behaviour was cited as a reason to release them once and for all. So serious questions there that have emerged. Uh, the Supreme Court, of course, is hearing this. So we'll have to wait and see what happens.
Yeah, almost three uh, petitioners had moved Supreme Court challenging the premature release of all these 11 convicts in the Bilkis Banu case and they had told the Supreme Court that all these 11 convicts uh, have, were convicted for heinous crime and they should not be uh, uh, given this premature uh, release because that would send a wrong message to the society and uh, the Supreme Court had uh, in earlier instance had issued notice to the state of Gujarat to respond to the petition and that's why uh, Gujarat government has filed its response yesterday in a form of a written affidavit today Supreme Court uh, bench led by Justice As uh, Ajay Rastogi will be hearing this petition by the three petitioners who have challenged this uh, premature release of all these 11 convicts. So the very important point that the Gujarat government is taking here or the ground that they are taking here against the uh, petitioners uh, here is that uh, uh, because all these three are uh, uh, public interest litigation in a criminal matter, there cannot be a public interest litigation that can be entertained. That seems to be the ground, the sole ground that the Gujarat government is taking here, saying that in a criminal matter, no third party can intervene. Only the party, only the parties who are directly uh, connected, to, connected to the matter can only uh, intervene in such a matter. In this case, all these three petitioners have nothing to do with this Bilkis Banu case and through a public interest litigation, they are challenging the premature release of all these 11 convicts and that's where uh, the Gujarat state government is asking asking the Supreme Court to dismiss all these three petitions and they have also uh, contended that all the rules were uh, strictly adhered to. As per the remission policy, all these 11 convicts have been uh, uh, given premature release. That seems to be the ground and they have also cited the good behaviour inside the prison as, uh, as a ground for premature release. But whereas, like Vasu explained, the document trail uh, clearly exposes that not just the CBI, which, which was the uh, investigation agency in this particular case, but also the uh, special court that tried that, that that, that tried all these 11 uh, people for this heinous crime, they had also opined, they had also recommended saying that all these 11 convicts should not be uh, given a premature uh, a release. That seems to be the uh, opinion of both CBA and also the special uh, CBA court. And these opinions were given way back in March 2021. Uh, when the application was moved in February 2021, in March 2021, both CBA and also this uh, uh, special CBA court had, uh, had opposed the premature release of all these convicts. But nevertheless, as per the opinion, opinion of the jail authorities and also the local administration that also includes the SP and also the uh, collector of this particular district, uh, the uh, MHA, the Ministry of Home Affairs here in centre had overruled the opinion or recommendation of both uh, CBA and also the special CBA court and then recommended for their premature release. News coming in from Jammu and Kashmir where two migrant labourers were killed during an overnight terrorist attack in a Shopian district. The attack has come days after Kashmiri Pandit was killed in a targeted attack in the same district. Now, according to the police, the terrorists lobbed a grenade on non-local labourers at Harman area of Shopia late last night. Two labourers identified as Ram Sagar and Monish Kumar, both residents of Kanuj in Uttar Pradesh, were killed in this grenade attack. The police say the attackers had been arrested hours after he lobbed the grenade. On Saturday, terrorists killed Puran Krishnan Bhatt, a Kashmiri Pandit at the Chaudhary Gun village in Shopia, the killing part of a series of targeted attacks has triggered protests in various parts of Jammu and Kashmir. Well, let's go across to Nazir for more on this. And Nazir, so another case of targeted killing and this time a grenade being lobbed at uh, migrant uh, workers. Well, um, uh, Gargi, during an overnight attack, in the grenade was lobbed on migrant workers who had come from UP to earn their living as laborers in Shopian district of South Kashmir. Two laborers, uh, uh, Manish Kumar and Sa uh, Ram Sagar, they have been killed. According to police, a grenade was lobbed on them when they were sleeping. They were living at a rented accommodation in a place called Harmin in, in, in Shopian district. This is not the first time a grenade has been lobbed. Grenades have been lobbed on the migrant workers. They have been several such incidents where innocent laborers who only come here to earn their living, they have become a target of this vicious cycle of violence. And uh, this attack has come day after day, just two days after a Kashmiri pundit was killed in a targeted attack in the same district of Shopia. According to police, uh, one of the, you know, the accused in this attack who lobbed the grenade, Imran Bashir Ghanai, has been arrested and raids are underway at different places to arrest his accomplice. As we have been reporting, whenever there have been these, these target attacks happen, police um, claim they have killed, you know, accused, they have arrested the accused, but attacks are not stopping 
it is these innocent people who bear the brunt of this senseless violence again a um, you know targeted attack in this terror incident two innocent laborers have been killed All right, uh, Nazir. Thanks so much for joining us uh, with those details. So, two uh, migrant workers from UP have been killed in that terrorist attack. Now, news from Delhi, and after a marathon nine-hour questioning by the CBI in the liquor policy case, Delhi's Deputy Chief Minister Manish Sisodia uh, claimed last night that he had been pressured to quit the Aam Aadmi Party. The agency officials had apparently implied that if he joined the BJP, which he flatly refused, they even threatened that his case can otherwise go like that of Delhi Minister Satyendra Jain, who has been in jail since May after being accused in a money laundering case. He alleged they will make you Chief Minister. He quoted. A officials are saying but the agency has issued a prompt denial denying these claims are uh, made by manish shodia let's just listen into what he said cbi ka ed ka jitna durupyog bhartiya janta party kar rahi hai wo ab sabko pata hai puri bhart uh, cbi aur ed ko unhone keval aur keval rajnitik machine bana ke rakh diya hai ye kisi se chhupa nahi hai aaj तो सीबीआई के ऑफिसर्स ऑफ कोर्स सरप्राइज होगा लोगों को अगर सीबीआई प्रेस प्रेसली जारी करे कि हाँ जी हमने ऑपरेशन नोटिस किया था लेकिन एक्साइज पॉलिसी पे कहीं फोकस नहीं है एक्साइज पॉलिसी में कहीं कोई करप्शन नहीं है एक्साइज पॉलिसी में कहीं कुछ नहीं मिल रहा है उनको ये बात कल की पूछताछ से ये और साबित हो गई मेरे सामने की सब पूरी तरह से फर्जी मनगढ़ंत कहानियां बनाई हुई है लेकिन ओवरऑल कल का मुझे बुलाने का मकसद वहां यही था कि मुझे इस बात के लिए डराया जाए कि किसी तरह से मैं आप छोड़ने को तैयार हो जाऊं मैं किसी तरह से बीजेपी में शामिल होने को तैयार हो जाऊं मैंने साफ साफ कह दिया भारतीय जनता पार्टी इतनी गंदी पार्टी है कि इसमें शामिल होना अपने आप को खत्म करना है अपनी आत्मा को मारना है Well, let's go across uh, to Vedant now for more. And uh, Mr. Shishodia making that statement this morning as well. Uh, Vedant, yesterday we saw how how they made a big show of Manish Shishodia going to the CBI for questioning, and then emerging and making these very shocking claims about being pressurized to join the BJP. Well, that's right, Gargi. We just saw Manish Sisodia leave for Ahmedabad, and before that, of course, he said that uh, yesterday uh, the CBI questioning revolved around intimidation. He said that he was intimidated to uh, leave the Aam Aadmi Party and perhaps join the BJP. Mm, and this comes after uh, the CBI issued a press statement saying that these allegations are absolutely false, and that questioning was totally based on legal and procedural, uh, you know, legal documents and you know. The Follow due procedure. Remember, our sources in the CBI told us that the questioning was based on four key aspects. Now, Gargi, what are these four key aspects? See, first of all, the entire questioning was based on uh, the the CBI FIR, which said that uh, liquor companies were involved in the framing and implementation of the liquor policy of the newly implemented liquor policy, which was implemented in November last year until it was withdrawn in August this year. So, the entire questioning was based on. that key aspect on which the cbi fir in which manish sisodia is the key accused is also based the second aspect was uh, the loss to public exchequer or the government treasury uh, so you know there are various figures that have come up the chief secretary has said something the delhi lg has said something so the so how much did the public exchequer how much loss did the public exchequer actually incur that was another aspect of the questioning and the third aspect was you know the kickbacks the alleged kickbacks and commissions received by the aam aadmi party uh, you know during the course of this new liquor policy so uh, what the CBI CBI essentially has alleged is that uh, out of the 12% profit made by liquor companies in the course of this uh, of the of the implementation of the new liquor policy 6% of it allegedly went to the aam aadmi party and the fourth aspect of the questioning was the post facto cabinet approval now the the CBI basically says why was due procedure not followed and why was uh, the approval of a competent authority not taken before this new excise policy was implemented so this is what our sources in the cbi say that these are the four key aspects on which the questioning was based 
Now, Manish Sisodia, after he came out, remember the high voltage political drama that we saw yesterday unfold. He made a road show out of, you know, uh, when he was going uh, for the questioning. He came out and said that these are all concocted stories and the, the allegations are all false and that the primary purpose of calling him for questioning was to intimidate him and perhaps leave the Ahmadmi Party and switch over to the BJP, something that the Ahmadmi Party has been alleging for a while now. Remember, the BJP yesterday said that it's all, you know, it's it's a celebration of corruption and you know it's all uh, if they they've been found liable if they're if they're perhaps liable for uh, such scams then they should uh, be graceful enough to uh, go for these questionings uh, silently so let's in fact see how this political drama plays out in Gujarat today because remember Arvind Kejriwal has returned to Delhi but Manish Sasodia will be campaigning in Gujarat today he he's expected to address the press as well at 12 uh, this afternoon but let's first look at what happened yesterday and what this high voltage political drama was that unfolded yesterday. Let's just have a look. Delhi Deputy Chief Minister Manish Sisodia on his way to the CBI after summons, but not without rallying up workers and supporters. He's called for questioning in the alleged liquor policy scam. गुजरात में भाजपा बुरी तरह से हार रही है इसलिए घबरा के मेरे ऊपर फर्जी मुकदमे करा के जेल भेज रहे हैं आज मैंने कहीं कुछ गड़बड़ नहीं किया इन्होंने पूरा मेरा घर छान मारा मेरे बैंक लॉकर छान मारे मेरे गांव में छान मारा इन्होंने मेरे आसपास सब छान मारा इनको मेरे भ्रष्टाचार का कोई सबूत नहीं मिला Sources in the agency say Sisodia was questioned on allegations that liquor companies were involved in framing Delhi liquor policy there was a loss to public exchequer. There were irregularities in the implementation, like post facto cabinet clearance, six percent commission to public servants. Jail ke taale tootenge, mani sisodia chootenge. In the meanwhile, campaigning in Gujarat, Arvind Kejriwal raised the pitch, linking the CBI summons to Sisodia and the buzz around his arrest to the upcoming assembly polls. जैसे ही आठ तारीख को नतीजे आएंगे गुजरात में आम आदमी पार्टी की सरकार बनेगी जेल के ताले टूटेंगे मनीष सिसोदिया छूटेंगे मैं मनीष जी को कहना चाहता हूं आप चिंता मत करो आपके ना आने से प्रचार बंद नहीं होने वाला यह सारी जनता प्रचार कर रही है घर घर जाके प्रचार कर रही है जब आपसे सवाल पूछताछ किया जाए तो आप जश्न मनाइए the BJP denied the CBI was on a political witch hunt and hit out at the Aam Aadmi Party alleging it was protecting the corrupt. Jis prakar se Mani Shishodhiya aaj e khule kaar mein apne samarthukon ke saath naare lagate huye phool mala daale huye nikle hain. Aisa lag raha hai maano koi kila fateh karke wapas a raha hai. It seems as if the Aam Aadmi Party has won the world cup of corruption. Delhi Deputy Chief Minister Manish Sisodia was questioned for over nine hours by CBI in the alleged liquor policy case. Sources say no new summons have been issued to Manish Sisodia and future course of action will be decided after examining his statements. With Priyanshi Sharma and camera person Pawan Kumar, this is Arvind Gunasega for NDTV. Welcome back. Some 9,000 delegates including Sonia Gandhi, Rahul Gandhi and Priyanka Gandhi Vadra voted yesterday to choose between Malik Arjun Kharge and Shashi Tharoor for the top post in the party. This is the party voted for a non-Gandhi chief for the first time in nearly 25 years. Now speaking to NDTV veteran leader P. Chidambaram dismissed what he called the assumption that the Gandhis would retain the remote control even after this election. Congress presidential elections and Sonia Gandhi, who has been at the helm for more than 20 years, appeared elated. But despite the electoral process, it's clear the Gandhi imprint will remain on whoever takes over as the new president. When it comes to who is our face for in the upcoming Lok Sabha election, because that's the normally how the question is framed, then definitely it's Rahul Gandhi ji. While Kharge is clearly the front-runner, it will be interesting to see how many votes Shashi Tharoor manages to get and if that's a signal to the grand old party for change. Whether it is a clean sweep or not, will be known only on 19th. 
I told him, whatever Udaipur declaration is there, that I am going to implement one by one if I get a chance. Whatever the outcome might be, I believe that every vote for me provides a signal, not just to the party, but to the country, that the Congress party is willing to change and is willing to do whatever is needed to reinvigorate ourselves and take on the divisive forces of the BJP. The next president will have his task cut out. Some leaders in the Congress have been demanding elections to the CWC. How much the next president will manage to be the change the Congress wants remains to be seen. Even as Sonia Gandhi still remains chairperson of the party's parliamentary board. But after the Congress president is elected, all eyes will be on Rajasthan, where front-runner Ashok Gehlot dropped out of the Congress race even before it began. And as his MLAs went in for a standoff with the Congress High Command over who should be the next Chief Minister, Ashok Gehlot, who voted in Rajasthan, has made it clear he is not giving in so easily. <laughs> Do you feel that whoever the new president is going is uh, will be able to settle a sort of a leadership whoever, dispute in whoever Rajasthan? Whoever becomes a Congress president will have the fullest support of every single Congress worker in this hmm. country. Sachin Pilot cast his vote in Delhi and clearly resolving the Rajasthan factional fight is the immediate task for the next Congress president. NDTV Bureau Report. In other news, Justice D.Y. Chandrachur will be the Chief Justice of India from the 9th of November. Law Minister Kiran Rijiju has said Chief Justice Yuyu Lalit, who is set to retire on November 8th, recommended Justice Chandrachur as his successor. And while Justice Lalit has had a brief tenure of just 74 days, Justice Chandrachur will now serve as the Chief Justice of India for two years. Uh, Justice Chandrachur will retire on November 10th, 2024. Justice Chandrachur was elevated to the Supreme Court on May 13, 2016 and he's currently the senior most Supreme Court judge after Justice Lalit. Now, Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Monday launched a new scheme, Pradhan Mantri Bharatiya Jan Urvarak Pariyojana, One Nation, One Fertilizer, under which it's mandatory for companies to market all subsidized fertilizers under a single brand name, Bharat. Now, in the country, the Bharat brand will be the same as the Bharat brand. फर्टिलाइजर का ब्रांड एक ही होगा तो कंपनी के नाम पर फर्टिलाइजर को लेकर होने वाली मारामारी भी खत्म हो जाएगी इससे फर्टिलाइजर की कीमत भी कम होगी खाद तेजी से पर्याप्त मात्रा में उपलब्ध होगा and in a setback to the BJP, the Congress dominated the results of elections to the posts of Panchayat Samiti chairpersons and deputy chairpersons in Maharashtra's Nagpur. Now, the BJP didn't win a single post of chairperson. It won only three seats of deputy chairperson. And Nagpur is the home ground of Maharashtra BJP Chief Chandrasekhar Bhavankule, Deputy Chief Minister Devinder Fadnavis and Union Minister Nitin Gatkari. It also houses the headquarters of the RSS, the ideological mentor of the BJP, which is in power in the state and the center. The Congress, however, won nine of the 13 posts of chairpersons and eight out of the 13 posts of deputy chairperson in Nagpur. The Nationalist Congress Party, or NCP, won three posts of chairperson, while the Shiv Sena won one such post. And staying with news of Maharashtra from Pune now and due to heavy rainfall for over 90 minutes yesterday night, there was severe water logging in several low-lying areas of Pune. The city's Shivaji Nagar area alone reportedly received around 81 millimeters of rainfall in just a couple of hours. There are also reports of several trees that were uprooted and in some low-lying areas, vehicles were submerged in the rainwater. In fact, the railway station uh, too experienced flash floods. Uh, water logging was reported in Pune's Khondwa, Khurd, Mangalwar, Pet and Kodrud area. There you can see that water logging after 90 minutes of heavy rainfall. 
All right, moving on to news of cricket and cricket administration. Roger Binney will formally become the first World Cup champion to be president of the Board of Control for Cricket in India today during the BCCI's 91st annual general meeting. Uh, Binney, the president of the Karnataka State Cricket Association, will take over the reins from former India captain Saurav Ganguly. While the BCCI election results will be formally announced during the AGM, all the posts have been decided uncontested. The AGM, though, may witness a heated discussion while finalizing the BCCI's representative to the International Cricket Council. And will India field a candidate for ICC or back Greg Barkley? And sources have said that Anurag Thakur and N. Srinivasan's names have been discussed as the candidates for the ICC. Now, the AGM, which takes place in Mumbai, has been scheduled in a South uh, a Mumbai hotel rather than the BCCI headquarters. Also, Jay Shah will be re-inducted as the BCCI secretary. And with Arun Dhumal, the outgoing treasurer, and Avishek Dalmia said to be elected unopposed as the Indian Premier League Governing Council members, Dhumal is said to be replacing uh, replace former India cricketer uh, Brijesh Patel as the IPL chairman. All right, so Saurav Gangli said to be replaced today. Now, Mamta Banerjee, meanwhile, has said that Saurav Gangli had been unfairly left out and appealed yesterday to Prime Minister Narendra Modi to send him to the ICC, that's the International Cricket Council. Leader of opposition in Bengal, Suvendu Adhikari, reacted to the comment saying Mamta Banerjee should know that the Prime Minister does not intervene in cricket administration. A day ahead of the BCCI annual general meeting comes Mamata Banerjee's appeal for Saurav Ganguly. My humble regards to the Prime Minister. Please take care that Saurav must be allowed to contest the ICC election. He has been deprived. Why he has been deprived? What is his fault? The West Bengal Chief Minister on Monday expressed her shock at Saurav Ganguly not getting renominated for the post of BCCI President, but Jay Shah being allowed a second term as Secretary. The TMC had earlier registered a strong protest against Ganguly's removal. They had alleged that the former India skipper was paying the price for saying no to joining the BJP. Meanwhile, Bengal's leader of opposition and BJP leader Shubhendu Adhikari countered the attack by Mamata Banerjee. हमारे हिंदुस्तान की क्रिकेट की दुनिया में एक बड़ा सितार के नाम होते हैं सौरभ गांगुली उनको पद से हटाए गए उनको गरिमा को खत्म किए गए और उनसे बदसलूकी करते हुए ये घोर अन्याय किए गए हैं Political power plays have always been witnessed in BCCI it has been widely reported that Amit Shah met the BCCI top brass including Ganguly on 6th October at his house in New Delhi during which Ganguly's exit route was charted so is Mamata Banerjee responding to the BJP's influence on the BCCI? Her requests, however, are unlikely to be heard. But with Saurav Ganguly, the king of comebacks, announcing that he will contest the election for the president of the Cricket Association of Bengal, he still has his chance to get back into cricket administration. With Rika Roy in New Delhi and camera person under the Tripathi in Kolkata, Saurabh Gupta, NDTV. Now, the Prime Minister will be visiting Ayodhya on the 23rd of October and visit uh, the Sri Ram Janbhumi at 5 o'clock. Uh, this has been announced. The Prime Minister will also be present for the consecration of the Sri Ram Katha Park at 5.40 p.m. and participate in the Aarti program at a new ghat on the banks of the Saryu River at 6.30 p.m. There will also be a fireworks display at 7.30 p.m. Before this, on October 21st and 22nd, the Prime Minister will be uh, on a visit of Kedarnath and Badrinath in Uttarakhand. 
After a marathon nine-hour questioning by the CBI in the liquor policy case, Delhi's Deputy Chief Minister Manish Shishodia claimed that he was pressured to quit the Ahmadmi Party. The agency officials, he claimed, uh, implied that if he joined the BJP, which he flatly refused, they even threatened that his case can otherwise go like that of Delhi Minister Satyendra Jain, who's been in jail in, since May after being accused in a money laundering case. Uh, they will make you Chief Minister, he quoted the officials as saying, but the agency issued a prompt denial. Here's what Manisha Shodia said this morning. CBI ka, ED ka jitna durupyog Bharti Janta Party kar rahi hai, wo ab sab ko pata hai. Puri bar, uh, CBI aur ED ko unho ne keval aur keval rajnitik machine bana ke rakh diya hai. Ye kisi se chupa nahi hai aaj. To CBI ke officers, of course, uh, surprise hoga logo ko agar CBI pressly jari kare ki haan ji, hamne operation notice kiya tha. Lekin Excise policy पे कहीं focus नहीं है, excise policy में कहीं कोई corruption नहीं है, excise policy में कहीं कुछ नहीं मिल रहा है उनको, ये बात कल की पूछता से ये और साबित हो गई मेरे सामने कि सब पूरी तरह से फर्जी मनगढ़ंत कहानियां बनाई हुई हैं, लेकिन overall कल का मुझे बुलाने का मकसद वहाँ यही था कि मुझे इस बात के लिए डराया जाए कि किसी तरह से मैं आप छोड़ने को तैयार हो जाऊं मैं किसी तरह से बीजेपी में शामिल होने को तैयार हो जाऊं मैंने साफ साफ कह दिया भारतीय जनता पार्टी इतनी गंदी पार्टी है कि इसमें शामिल होना अपने आप को खत्म करना है अपनी आत्मा को मारना है News now from the UK. In, in six short weeks, Britain's latest Prime Minister seems on her way out. In another U-turn, Liz Truss reversed a mini-budget announced just weeks ago. And Liz Truss is now under pressure as three Tory MPs have publicly called for her to quit. So are the Tories finally ready for Rishi? Vishnu Som reports. So let's bring up those graphics where we can actually show you the trends of this wildly swinging up and down chances of him becoming UK Prime Minister. He is now back on top. Who knows, will, he ha will the United Kingdom have a Prime Minister of Indian origin? Let's start with March 2000. He was favourite to be Prime Minister after Boris Johnson. By April, that started plummeting with his wife's tax issues and allegations that he had a green card for the US. But with Boris Johnson's increasingly seen to be in trouble and following Mr. Johnson's resignation, Rishi Sunak's chances improved. But while many vouched for the highly educated and skilled Chancellor of the Exchequer, grassroots voters of the party, his party had a problem. And his fortunes appeared to be wavering by September. In fact, by the end of September last month, there appeared to be no chance of him becoming Prime Minister. But we are now in October. And it's clear that Liz Truss's term has been an out-and-out -out disaster. And Rishi Sunak appears to be back in the driving seat. Some say the hot favourite to become UK's Prime Minister. So elections to the post of the Congress President uh, is now over. The election process is over. The uh, voting is over and the counting is going to take place uh, in a few days from now. But uh, apart from being the former Finance Minister, there is another achievement that we would like to talk about here as we introduce Mr. P. Chidamram. You were the first voter today. I believe so. <laughs> I was there at uh, quarter to ten and when the Voting opened at 10 o'clock. The election authority said you can vote. Uh, we were three of us there, so I voted first. What does this mean, this whole process mean, Mr. Chinnam? See, this process, according to me, means that we are opening up the party to new people. I'm not uh, so uh, concerned about the voting for the Congress president. But eventually, I think this will percolate down to voting for the working committee, mm -hmm. voting for the PCC president, mm -hmm. and voting for the DCC president and the bloc president. Mm -hmm. I think if this percolates down to voting at the lowest unit, namely the bloc congress committee, that will open up the party to a large number of new people mm -hmm. to join the party. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there is one criticism that often comes uh, the way of the Congress Party, and that is uh, you carry out whatever exercise in a, of inner party democracy elections. Ultimately, the decision is going to rest uh, at the doorstep of Ten Janpat or the Gandhi family. No, no, this, is a, this is a stock criticism. Hmm. The Gandhis have made it clear that they have no official candidate and anybody can contest. Let's assume that. This first election, um, the Gandhis will still have 
a great degree of influence in the running of the party at the national level. But when it percolates down, are you suggesting that the Gandhis or uh, whoever of the Gandhi family will have an influence over the block committee decision or the district committee decision? So I'm looking at it from a longer term. This is the beginning and I hope that the new Congress president will ensure that all future committees are constituted through elections. Uh, Mr. Chidamam, how does this process help, uh, say, a party as old as the Congress party? Because we see that no other party uh, has held elections for, uh, for the post of the president. Even the Congress party is holding it after 22 years, more than two decades. No other party will, because the a way of functioning political parties in this country is to forge consensus. Uh, we've had, according to some report, six elections in the last uh, several decades. I think the most famous one was between uh, Patabi Sitaramaya and Subhash Chandra Bose. Now, therefore, it has captured the imagination of the media, of the people, that the Congress party is holding an election. <laughs> but no other party um, can utter a word of criticism against the Congress party because no other party holds an election. Therefore, we have made a beginning. I'm not saying this is perfect. Nobody says this is perfect. But this is a good beginning and this will percolate, I hope. Hmm. Now, Mr. Chidamram, in the case of these two candidates, uh, both very able, they both congratulated one another also this morning. Uh, but again, there is an allegation that one person is uh, a more of a Sarkari candidate uh, with, with the backing of, uh, of the top leadership and the other is doing his own thing uh, to be a contender. See, we are not in Sarkar, so why do you call us... No, Sarkari in the sense uh, yeah. with the backing and the blessing of the... No, no, the that leadership. is imputed, uh, that is uh, suggested. Uh, I won't comment on that, but clearly... Uh, the overwhelming majority of the top leaders of the party at the national level and the state level did support Mr. Karge. I think Mr. Tharoor is aware of that. Yet I congratulate him for not withdrawing his candidature and contesting and seeing it through until the last vote. Now, Mr. Chidamram, uh, you see... So let's let's say, for instance, one of these people, I don't know the result, uh, but uh, come uh, counting day, one person is elected the new Congress president. Do you think that the people in the party uh, and all those who seek a decision would treat the decision of the Congress president as final? Or will they again look at the Gandhis uh, to be, you know, that sort of a supreme court in their life, that some decision can be taken by by someone, but the supreme leader's decision will, will be final. See, this is again assuming that there are only major um, cataclysmic decisions to be taken. There are a number of routine decisions have to be taken. For example, um, people have completed three years or five years in a post. A decision has to be taken whether the block committee president or the district committee president will be replaced. Uh, I have uh, pending requests. Uh, there are disciplinary reactions which are pending against people who voted or worked against the official candidate in the uh, last uh, parliament election and the last assembly election. Mm. Those decisions are held up today mm. because there is no one uh, sitting in the office and looking at it in an administrative sense. Mm. So I think, I think whoever wins... Um, mm. Uh, I know who, who, who will win, but be that as it may. Uh, whoever wins, I hope that 90-95% of the administrative managerial decisions will all be taken in time uh, under the authority of the Congress President. Yes, of course, the major decisions would have to involve other leaders, the Congress Working Committee, if there is a parliamentary board, the Congress Parliamentary Board, and in which the Gandhis will surely be represented. Uh, how can you imagine that the Gandhis post today will vanish from the Congress Working Committee or the Parliamentary Board if one is constituted? The Gandhis will be there and I think that is the right thing to do. Mm. The Gandhis um, uh, will have a view and I think the new Congress President must take into account their views. Mm.
but mr chidambaram see one thing is for them to have a view and the other is to be uh, to exert that view and be exacting about it this is a in, suspicion in a, yeah this is a suspicion hmm. you you are suspecting the word <laughs> of the gandhis i don't hmm. i accept it at face value they said whoever is the congress president we are willing to work with him hmm. and it will you you are pretty sure it's not going to be the other way around that whoever is the congress president will have to work with the with the gandhis he has to work with the gandhis he has to work with the state leaders mm. see for example let me tell you let me give you an example mm. suppose he is taking a decision on karnataka mm. can he ignore the views of siddaramaiya ji and uh, dk shiv kumar ji uh, he can't mm. if you are taking a decision about madhya pradesh whether whether they are in the working committee or parliamentary board can you ignore the views of digvijay singh ji and uh, kamal nath ji so i think uh, you have to treat the matter as a major change that has happened after as i said 22 years but that's a welcome change and i'm sure the new congress president will learn to work with everybody and everybody else will learn to work with him How many times have you voted in this uh, internal uh, democratic process? You see, I voted when Indira Gandhi was challenged uh, way back. Mm. But in the next two elections, you will remember, Mr. Mupanar had formed his own TMC. Correct. So between 1996 Tamil Manila and Congress. Tamil Manila Congress mm. between 1996 mm. and I think um, 2000, 2001 or two, there were two elections. Mm. Uh, so i didn't vote there but uh, you know although we called ourselves tamil manila congress mm. n- nobody uh, con- considered ourselves as a rebel outfit <laughs> we were rebelling only against mr narsimha mm. so i was watching it closely mm. um, but i have voted in the election which indira gandhi mm. uh, contested and somebody contested against her uh,